Hey everyone, uh, my name is Jason Gaitandi, and I'll be telling you about our work on virtues of patients in strategic queuing systems and, at EC2021. And this is joint work with Eva Tardos, also at Cornell. So the motivation for this work comes from games and the price of anarchy. So consider agents interacting strategically in some game. The main questions we want to understand are what kinds of outcomes arise, and even more importantly, how good are they with respect to some notion of welfare? So the price of anarchy just measures the worst case gap between social welfare at a Nash equilibrium, say, compared to the social optimum. And this measure is often very robust, meaning it often extends to learning outcomes in repeated games where the same game is being repeated uh, many times. But something that's not so well understood is, do price of anarchy style bounds still hold when you have strong dependence between the games that are played in each round? So previous work that we did at EC 2020, we actually studied this question in a simplified queuing model that does have a strong notion of state, and where queues are thought of as no regret learners. And what we showed then is that actually you just need two times the amount of system capacity to ensure that queue lengths remain stable over time, as you would for centralized stability. So when you can centrally coordinate the queues to achieve a stable outcome. And what I mean by stable is we assume that what we want is that the number of packets that are unserviced in the system grows sublinearly with time. But in this work, we show that actually, this is actually a little suboptimal. And in fact, no regret learning can look pretty myopic. And in particular, what we show is that you can actually achieve stability with just E over E minus one, which is roughly 1.58 times extra capacity as the centralized setting if queues are thought of as sufficiently patient in a way we'll define in just a sec. So let me tell you about our simplified model of queuing. So we have a subset of queues, which are the agents, and a set of servers, which are the resources they sort of compete over. And so what happens is that each time step, QI will receive a new packet with probability lambda i. Server j can succeed at a given time at serving a packet with probability mu j. And so what happens at each time is that each queue can send one packet to send to exactly one server to try to get service. So in this case, uh, the first two queues chose to send a packet to server one, and then the last queue chose to send to server two. And then what happens is, as I said, a server can process at most one packet, uh, according to this probability mu, and any unserved packet will need to get returned to its queue. So in this case, server one succeeded, and it chose to service Q1's packet, and so it had to send Q2's packet, pack, uh, packet back to it. On the other hand, server two just failed, so it couldn't succeed at serving a packet, so it had to send Q3's packet back to it. And the way we assume that servers choose among the packets it receives uh, when it's successful is it'll attempt to serve the oldest packet it arrives, breaking ties arbitrarily. And so, I told you about stability in the context of queue lengths. We want the queue lengths to remain sublinear in time. But it'll actually turn out to be more convenient for us to talk about queue ages. And so what we'll actually do in this uh, talk is we're going to consider a deferred decisions version of this model, where instead we only keep track of the oldest packet for each queue. And we measure that via the age of the queue, namely the age of its oldest packet. And then what we do is when a queue manages to clear its oldest packet, we get the age of its new oldest packet by adding a geometric random variable to its previous age. And the reason why this is uh, the same, and in fact, all the stability properties are equivalent, is because uh, the gaps between these Bernoulli arrivals are just geometric random variables. So in particular, if time progresses and a queue receives some number of packets at different times, the gaps between these arrivals are actually geometric random variables. And that's sort of why this deferred decisions model is completely equivalent. So as a baseline measure for when this queuing system could possibly be stable, uh, let's first assume that uh, lambda 1 is the highest and then lambda 2 and so on. So Q1 has the highest arrival rate. And similarly, let's assume that server 1 has the highest success rate uh, and then descending from that. And then a necessary and sufficient condition for centralized stability is that for all k, the sum of the top k arrival rates is at most the sum of the top k service rates. Uh, and this is maybe somewhat intuitive, and it somehow follows uh, from the fact that each queue can only send a single packet in each round. So what are the results for selfish queuing then, given that that was the centralized version? 
So what we showed last year was that if queues use no regret algorithms to choose the servers, um, then what you need is for all k, you need that the sum of the top k arrival rates is at most one half times the sum of the top k service rates. And if this is the case and queues use no regret algorithms to choose the servers, then the queue lengths or equivalently ages are going to grow sublinearly in time. So now what we're going to show in this work is that if queues choose uh, servers in a patient manner, which we'll define in just a sec, then what you need is for any k, just that the sum of the top k arrival rates is at most e minus 1 over e times the sum of the top k service rate. So this is actually a weaker inequality. And if that's the case, then in every equilibria of this patient queuing game, uh, queue lengths and ages are going to grow sublinearly. Uh, and just to motivate sort of why this no regret has can be improved, uh, the last year's result, here's an example of a sort of myopic no regret system. So in this system, we have two queues with arrival rates a little bit over 0.5. We've got a perfect server that'll always be able to clear a packet that it gets in a round. And then we have this, uh, this server whose uh, success rate is a little bit under a half. And suppose that both queues just always send to this top server. You can show that this is actually no regret, meaning that neither queue actually wants to deviate to this bottom server. And the reason for that is because by the symmetry in the system, they're basically going to age at an equal rate. So they're going to essentially split this top server evenly. And so they'll basically get a 0.5 effective service rate. Um, so this is no regret because if they were to go to this inferior server, that looks worse than that what they would get had they just stayed at the server they're currently choosing. But this will actually lead to linear growth because if they're only clearing at a rate of 0.5, well, their arrival rate's a little bit higher. So you're going to get this linear growth. But let's think about what would happen if, say, the second queue actually did deviate a little bit to this inferior server. Even though this looked a little silly from the no regret perspective, what actually happens is the following. First, from the perspective of Q1, now they're actually alone at this top server uh, some amount of the time, and therefore they'll actually clear a little bit faster. And in fact, they'll be stable. And then what happens is this Q2, because Q1 is clearing a little faster, Q2, when they compete on this top server, they'll actually tend to win more often because they're actually a little bit older. And so actually both queues will find that, they're, uh, that they'll be stable under this deviation. So it turns out that moving to this inferior server actually selfishly helps both queues in this system. So what's going on here? Uh, you can actually test this out like empirically by just you know, simulating a no regret algorithm. And it seems to have this very similar behavior where they're somehow both sending to this top server, even though it would asymptotically be better off to back off a little bit. And the reason for this is it seems that no regret's a little bit too myopic in evaluating servers. In particular, it's not patient enough to see the asymptotic benefits of sometimes sending to bad servers. And so in this work, we're going to study a patient queuing game where queues have stationary strategies over servers. So let's define this a little bit more formally. Each QI in this game is going to pick a fixed randomization over servers, which will denote PI, that it will play in every round it has a packet. So it'll randomize its choice according to this fixed distribution it chooses. When each queue fixes a randomization, this will induce a Markov chain on the queue ages. And each QI's goal in choosing their randomization is to minimize their expected asymptotic aging rate, which we define as the limb soup of the expected age of QI at time t over t that you get when running this Markov chain with their chosen randomization. So they choose a randomization to minimize this quantity given what the others are doing. And the goal of our work is going to be to study the Nash equilibria of this game. So there's actually a couple of immediate problems with this formulation. The first is, what exactly are these asymptotic aging rates? Second is, even if we know this, why should there exist an equilibrium? And then only then can we talk about the price of anarchy. So already we're kind of getting these somewhat difficult probabilistic and game theoretic challenges in this formulation. But let's deal with them sort of one at a time. Uh, first, about this probabilistic thing, about what are the asymptotic aging rates. So let's first think about just the one queue, one server setting. So there's just one queue, one server. There's no strategies and there's no competition. This queue, just whenever it has a packet, it just sends it over to this server. So what happens in this system is that 
Well, the age of the packet of the queue will it'll go up by one deterministically in a time period just from the passage of time. And then it sends to this server and it'll clear with probability mu. And on the event that this server succeeds, the expected decrease in age for this queue is one over lambda. And the reason for that is, again, the expected value of a geometric random variable here is one over lambda. So at least heuristically, what we should expect the long run aging rate of this system to be should be one minus mu over lambda. So this mu probability of success times one over lambda decrease in age uh, when the server succeeds. And we should take the max of zero in this quantity uh, because aging rate should be non-negative. So in general, what happens? What we show on the probabilistic side is that for any fixed choice of P1 through Pn, these randomizations by the queues over servers, queues are gonna almost surely cluster into groups with the same long run aging rates. And so to find these clusters, you can do the following. The fastest aging subset S1 is gonna be, that you can find it as follows. Take the worst case subset uh, of n, the number of uh, q's, of this quantity, 1 minus mu over lambda, just like we saw before, where now lambda of a subset s is the sum of the arrival rates of the q's in the subset s, and mu of s is the total expected number of packets that are cleared by s when they have priority over the rest of the q's. So this is an exact generalization of this 1 over, uh, or this 1q, one, 1 server setting. And then to find the next fastest aging subset, you just recurse on the rest of the queues by, but you just have to discount the server success probabilities by the probability any queue in S1 sends to that server because they'll have priority in that case. So it turns out that this algorithm I just described to you has many analytic properties and many structural properties. In particular, the set of subsets with that maximum one over mu, uh, sorry, one minus mu over lambda uh, term at each step, the, the set of subsets that achieves that maximum is closed under unions and intersections. It turns out also that these aging rates given by that algorithm are continuous in these P1 through Pn. And putting it together with some other uh, facts about it, one can show that with these costs, these long run aging costs, there will exist a Nash equilibrium of the system using some fixed point theorem. And then, okay, going back to the original problem, the proof that this long, these are the, actually the long run rates, as you can probably imagine, it re relies pretty heavily on concentration inequalities and a pretty careful accounting uh, of this priority scheme. Uh, it's a little technical though. So now that we've dealt with that, we can talk about the price of anarchy. So at least intuitively, the worst case should look like the following. We have n equal queues and n equal servers, and then the queues uniformly mix over the servers. You can show that with the parameters chosen appropriately, in this case, you actually will get a Nash equilibrium. And the worst case actually in this case will need E over E minus one slack, uh, just from kind of a balls and bins analysis. Uh, but okay, how do we show that this really is the worst case? And what makes this actually a little tricky is that in general, what we know is that any fastest aging Q can't profitably benefit from deviating its choice of randomization at an equilibrium. But what's not clear is actually why. And the reason for that is Q incentives can come from many tight subsets. And we'll actually see an interesting example of that in just a second. So now we can get to kind of a proof sketch of our result. And our idea is going to be to continuously deform a Nash profile to one with more propor proportional lo loads on the servers. So in this worst case example, one thing you'll notice is that if I sum the probabilities of over Qs of the probability they send to a given server, you get one because it's gonna be one over n times n, which is one. And what you can show is actually given a total load on each server when load is defined in this way, the worst case uh, in terms of this aging rate is gonna be in this very symmetric profile. So we wanna continuously deform a Nash towards one that looks more like this worst case and we want to do this in a way that only increases the aging rate along this deformation. And if we can do that, then we can actually bound the final aging rate at the end of this. And the key idea we're going to use to do this is we're going to use some of these structural properties of the tight subsets. And so it actually turns out to be the case that the tight subsets inside this fastest aging group, they form levels. And it turns out that these levels are very closely determined to the game theoretic incentives of each queue. 
So here's a pretty interesting example. We've got three servers that have mu equals one and four equal queues. And these outer queues send all the time to an outer server. And then these middle two queues, they mostly split at the middle, but they also send a little bit to a respective outer server. And you can actually show that this is a Nash equilibrium. And the tight subsets, the, one that achieve, the ones that achieve this maximum aging rate, one minus uh, mu over lambda, you can show that they're this middle subset, uh, the left three, the right three, and all four of them. And just, I should note that this system of subsets actually is closed under unions and intersections like we promised. So all the subsets containing the middle two have the maximum rate in the algorithm. But as you can probably tell, these middle two queues are actually somehow the kernel of hardness of the system. So in the level terminology, these will be the level one queues, and then these remaining outer queues will end up being the level two queues. And so what you can show is that First, try the following scheduling process of this deformation. First, shift all the highest level queues towards this symmetrized profile. And one can show that this will actually succeed pretty directly from just the Nash definition. And then once we've done this for the higher levels, you would proceed, inductively proceed to the next lower level. And you can actually show that when you do this scheduling in this way, you actually manage to preserve all the relative incentives from uh, the Nash equilibrium. And so you can do this deformation in a way that will only in, uh, increase the aging rate. And so at the end of this process, you can bound the aging rate at this final highly symmetrized profile. And when you do this, you can arrive at this E over E minus 1 term. That was uh, our main result. So just to summarize what we've done in some future directions, um, again, the main problem that we're really interested in is understanding these price of anarchy style measures in repeated games with state. Um, and so now we've kind of given two ways of studying this problem, at least in this queuing system with state. The first was using this regular no regret learning, and now we've also sort of done it as a restricted game where the queues are more patient. Uh, and so one natural question is, can you extend these kinds of bounds to other natural games that have this carryover effect, namely like auctions with budgets or maybe more complicated routing or queuing schemes? Um, but maybe the bigger takeaway here is, we saw that no regret learning, even though it does something very uh, pretty reasonable, it can still be nonetheless pretty myopic. And in particular, a natural question is, can one obtain similar balance to what we did in this paper using just a better form of learning? And if so, what is this form of learning that can achieve it? And with that, thanks so much for listening.